away in Medina. Yes. So they were intending to kill him and destroy and annihilate all the people. However, you know when Muhammad came back with an army of 10,000 to Mecca from Medina after he had gained power? Yes. Before that, his people and himself, they were being oppressed by these Meccans, the Quraysh, the pagan Quraysh, and they were being persecuted, they were being killed, and they were being tortured. But when Muhammad came back with an army of 10,000, what did he do? This is when he was strong, when he could have easily killed all those people who were committing these atrocities. He could have easily killed them, but he did not. He chose to forgive. Now this shows the beauty of, G of Muhammad as a com not only a comforter, but one of his main titles in the Quran is he came as a Rahmatul Alameen, which means he came as a mercy to mankind. Yes, so Muhammad's approach and his way was of mercy, of kindness, and of giving comfort to those who were not, who were being oppressed, those who basically were being, um, uh, being uh, ridiculed or being discriminated in the society. Yes, especially the women. So the status of women was raised high during the time of Muhammad. During, before Muhammad, during the pagan, pagan era, they used to actually really be embarrassed whenever they used to have a child born to them was female. So what they used to do, they used to, some of them used to bury them alive. Not only kill them, they used to bury them alive. Yes. And this is, and this is the beauty of, of the Prophet Muhammad who basically banned all this. Yes. And he says this goes against what God would have required. Yes. To kill anyone without any justification is completely and utterly wrong. So you know the Geneva Convention which we have today, which was I think founded after the World Wars where millions of people were killed, both World War I and World War II, and majority of those people were the Christians who were killed and being and the ones perpetrating the killing, including the Nazis, yes? Because if you go to the, the, uh, the German cemeteries of these Nazis, they have a cross in that cemetery under which these Nazis are buried. So these people were clearly worshipping or at least claiming to believe in Christianity. Now, I don't know exactly what the personal beliefs are, but the important thing is that during World War I and World War II, these were the times when humanity has seen so much bloodshed that it has never seen either in the past or any time in the, in, in the present. You're talking about 60 to 70 million people losing their lives for this, for, for, for the time that these wars were fought. fought. In, in each one of them, there was inhuman destruction of property and, and life because they had weapons of mass destruction a lot. Now, sorry, what were we talking about? Yeah, why did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came as a comforter? So does that give you a perspective about Muhammad? Yes. The last question is, you, do you know the book of Revelation? Yes. So do you know the last chapter? I know when I should have quoted it. I'm just asking, do you have an idea about the last chapter? Give me, in the last give chapter, me a the book of Revelation, question. It's um, very explicit that anything which is written after the Bible is yeah. a lie. So it's very do clear. Re do you remember the specific verse? I can. I would like to. I normally like to reason, look at them in yeah, context. The yes. reason I ask that is because I obviously have family who are like Mormon, and you know, prophet in Mormonism came after Christianity. Prophet Muhammad came after Christianity. Sikhism's after Christianity. And when I look at that verse, the Revelation, I'm like. But what about Jesus' statement when he says that? He will send a comforter after him. And we have already analyzed why it cannot be the Holy Spirit. So you tell me who came after Jesus, who believes Jesus is, is a Messiah. Because anyone who doesn't accept Jesus as a Messiah, and as, as basically what Jesus preached with regards to himself, because Jesus never claimed to be God. You see what I mean? This is something that you might have been taught from school. But Jesus, in the Bible, if you can show me any verse, where, is, where he says, I am God, worship me, then yes. Okay, so says, I am the disciple of the one, John 17. Are you going to worship the disciples? Oh, you worship the disciples? See what I mean? This becomes a shouting match now. Don't shout at him. Yes. He's having a good conversation. No, don't shout at him. Don't shout at him. Okay, just ignore him. We normally ignore the hacklers. Look, at the end of the day, yeah. for me, it's because I've taught the religions and I've lived in different countries and you start to understand people they're taught different things from being a kid yeah. and all it comes down to is belief. No, but you, you're right, you know, but there's so much to learn. Like as an RE teacher, you might have learned a few things. 
I'm, I might have learned a few things from you. You see what I mean? So at the end of the day, our life from cradle to grave is one of acquiring knowledge. And this is something we as, regardless of your faith, whether you're a Muslim, Christian, even an atheist, agnostic, Hindu, doesn't matter what, what your religion is, this is something that we have been given as a faculty, our intellect. Why don't we make use of it? So when we have a revelation from God, which tells you that God is one, yes? Which tells you that God is not someone who is a mortal, which tells you that God is all-knowing. You see, when Jesus came to this earth and he was asked about the last hour, yes? In Mark 13, 32, Jesus says, nobody knows the hour, not the angels in heaven, not the son, referring to himself, except the father in heaven. You see what I mean? So when Jesus says that only the Father knows the last hour, which means the day of judgment, yes, then it tells us something which Jesus is trying to tell us throughout the Bible. Remember, Jesus is always sub subservient, subordinate to Almighty God. If he's subordinate to Almighty God, then he cannot be God. If he claims that he doesn't know the hour, he cannot be omniscient like God Almighty. If he died according to your belief, then he cannot be immortal. But that's all from the Bible. What you're just saying is, is actually a later teaching. You know what you said? Do not believe something that has come later. This belief in Trinity actually came in the fourth century. It was established in the Council of Constantinople. And this is much later, 300 years after Jesus. Now you tell me, why would Jesus not preach something so important as a central creed of Christianity, the Trinity? I, I don't think, I, for me personally, in the New Testament, he does talk about a trinity. Right. Well, he talks about the Holy Spirit. You, you'll say the comfort is Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. You'll say the comfort is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, he talks about the Father and he talks about him as the Son. How does that make you the trinity? A trinity doesn't mean three entities. A, tri a trinity means these three entities are when one I, being. When I say trinity, I don't mean it in the context of Catholicism. Any, any. In just three any. offices. Three offices. See, you know, different representations. Are you a Protestant? Yeah. So well, you see, actually, to be fair, I'm not really, but I was brought up kind of mixed, so I get okay. like there's a different uh, interpretation of different meanings. They might use different terminology, but their belief in terms of the Trinity yeah. is not very different. So they all right. believe these three persons are one being. Yeah. You see what I mean? So you see, the Trinity doesn't mean three persons. Yeah. So even if you look individually in the Bible, you might, okay. This is talking about the Father as God. This is talking about the Son as God. This is talking about the Holy Spirit as God. That doesn't make it the Trinity. The Trinity has to be that these three have to be declared or advocated or preached as one God. And we don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Why do you, do you, are you, going, you believe in paradise, heaven? Yeah, yeah, we believe in, the, in Jannah. We call it the Jannah. Yeah. Yeah. Why, how do you know for certain you go Oh, I see. You see, the day of judgment is not upon us. The day of judgment is only the realm of God Almighty. He's the one who is going to ultimately judge. So it's not for me to say that I go to heaven or you go to heaven or you go to hell or I go to hell. It doesn't work like that. Salvation in, in Islam is something which is mentioned very clearly in the Quran. Anyone who worships one true God without associating partners in him and believes in his messengers, his books, his angels, yes, and the life after death, and believes in Qadr, which is basically the decree of God, then this person is the one who has got Iman. Iman, this belief in belief in this in these principles, is what uh, is going to take you to heaven, to paradise, yes, to Jannah. The, the, the thing that I, the, the reason I'm asking you yeah. is because the kids always used to ask me this question. Um, and in the textbooks they're taught in Islam, you have your good deeds and your bad deeds. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So our good deeds and bad deeds are also important. However, what ultimately gives, our salva gives us salvation and admits us to Jannah is the mercy of Allah. Okay, so good deeds, for example, on the Day of Judgment, God is going to weigh your good deeds against your bad deeds. And this is God basically trying to, sorry, God, God, God has to admit you in Jannah depending on the deeds that you have done. So your you have like different levels in, in Jannah, in paradise, yes? So you have the level which it might be like, you know, in, a, in, a, in an airplane, you have a first class, the business class and you have the economy class. Depending on how much you pay, 
you are, you are able to sit in, in these categories. So the more deeds you have done, the more righteousness you, you're done, the best, yeah, like, yeah, it could be, it could be all of that. So the five pillars of Islam, uh, so belief in God, belief uh, to pray five times a day, to uh, give charity, uh, which is zakat, to fast in the month of Ramadan, and to go for Hajj if you're able to. This is the five pillars. In addition to the six, uh, uh, the six principles of Islam, which I ta taught you earlier. If someone doesn't do, I know, I know. There's rules around like pilgrimage, sick and elderly don't need to accept. But if someone doesn't do Hajj, for example, do they get it? Or don't if they, oh no! Ultimately, all the Muslims get into paradise. So there is a hadith which says that if someone has iman, yes, that means belief and faith within them, equal to a mustard seed, yes, then he will smell the fragrance of paradise. He will be in paradise, yes. But obviously, God is going to hold you accountable for the sins you have committed. So it doesn't mean just because you are a Muslim you go straight to heaven. No, just because if you have, so imagine you kill somebody or you basically uh, took somebody's wealth. Uh, uh, basically, uh, unjustified, uh, you know, in a way which is unjustified, yeah. then you will be held accountable on the day of judgment, and you will have to go through the punishment. How do you, well, how do you cancel out this? Because I can never answer the kids. Though. They were like, Miss, how, how do you cancel out? So you can cancel out your bad deeds with your good deeds. Okay. So do more good deeds. If you have done a bad deed, then always substitute. Sorry, uh, uh, do a do a good deed to basically erase that bad deed. But it depends on the bad deed. For example. If you have killed someone, obviously you can't just erase it, okay? So even in the Old Testament, you can't just erase it. There was a death penalty for it. And there's death penalty in Islam for murder, for rape, for these, for these crimes which you cannot just undo. But there are things which you can basically if you have, I don't know. So do you not believe? If you, oh, one of the main things is to ask forgiveness. Yes, yeah. to ask forgiveness is something which is a duty of Muslim, regardless of whether you think you have done any uh, wrong or not. To seek forgiveness is not only humbling yourself, but it's also, yeah, it's, it's kind of humbling yourself in front of God Almighty, and it's also wiping away your sins. He gets a death penalty. But does he get into paradise? He does get into paradise after he has served his time in hell for that punishment, depending on how Allah wants to punish him. Okay, so you have like a purgatory as well? You have like the no, no, this is not purgatory. This is hell. This is after purgatory. So we have something called, uh, this is uh, an interim between. So when you die, yes, you have a place you go to, not paradise or hell directly, because that happens after the day of judgment. Okay, so we have something like the purgatory, and um, skips skips my uh, mind as to what is what is called, but I'm sure the uh, the people who are listening to this know this. A barzak, yeah, that's the one. So it's called Alam al Barzak, and Barzak is like the purgatory which you're talking about. Yes. On the, this is after the day of judgment. With his, like, deeds, his good and yeah. bad deeds. So this is after the day of judgment, which is called uh, Sirat, which is called the Pul Sirat, the bridge called Sirat, the way. And this is something which every person has to cross. Then, depending on his uh, deeds, good or bad, he will either cross it and go to paradise, or be cut and go to hellfire. And then. After serving his time as a Muslim in the hellfire, eventually one day he will be admitted into paradise. Even if he has a mustard seed of um, faith or belief in the oneness of God, in the in the belief, uh, faith in Islam, because in the Quran Allah says the only religion acceptable to God is Islam. And Islam, this has a very broad um, uh, description, which is basically like I told you the six. Articles of faith, yeah. yes, and also the uh, five pillars of Islam. So this encapsulates what Islam is. Yeah. So once the message is clear to you about what Islam is, and then you reject it, then you will be held accountable on the day of judgment. Can I just ask one last question? No, no, you're free to ask the answer. You said to me earlier that the central premise in the Quran is if a man kills another man, it's as if he killed the whole of mankind. This is one of the main yeah. principles, not the central, but it's one of the main. main 
why would say life in any religion is a central premise? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. So how does that work for the man who kills someone, who is Muslim, who does his punishment? How does that work? So he does get his punishment, right? He does get his punishment in, in the hellfire. And then, once he has served his punishment, then he's admitted into paradise. Just like when somebody gets a life, uh, sorry, life sentence, or even some, any, any sort of sentencing, they go to prison, serve their time in prison, and then they're eventually released once their term has been served. Same way. So, inshallah, I mean, look into the Quran when you got time. If you don't have a copy, I'll give you a free copy. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. As a teacher, you have to. Yeah, yeah, of course. Definitely. Thank you so much for talking. You're welcome. I really enjoyed it. I genuinely enjoyed it. I don't know this other gentleman, uncle, whoever he is. Yeah, Uncle Osman, yes. That he should, like, he was so rude to the woman earlier. Like, he was so rude. And he just came across, honestly, so uneducated when he's shouting at women like that. That's, that's wrong. And, and uh, it is wrong. And we should pray that... God gives him and us the ability to be patient with each other and to learn from each other because that, that's the only way we can get to understand each other because if we shout and if we ridicule each other then obviously that creates an animosity and obviously no one will listen. You see what I mean? Yeah, unfortunately many many people who come to this park it brings out the worst in them. I mean, it's, it's something that we all try to avoid, but sometimes it's inevitable. It's, I think, uh, is this your first time at Speaker's Corner? Have you been here before? I've walked past it so many times. <laughs> oh, do you? First, okay. No, it's the first time I've ever like, stopped by. Okay. Hope you come back. Well, we have under the chair Hashim. Hashim. What's your name? It's Jillian. Jillian? Yeah. Very nice meeting you. Jillian? Shukran. Yes, Afan. <laughs> Which part in uh, the Middle East were you? I lived in Dubai. Dubai. Oh, all right, great. Yes, yes. Inshallah, Allah gives you Hidayah. Uh, and um, we, 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 we pray to Allah, to the one true God, that He looks after all of us and gives us the ability to learn and to seek the path which is of the truth. Okay? And with that, I bid you farewell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Yes, Jazakallah khairan. Yes,